Assalamu alaikum. Viewers of this channel may remember that in March of this year, I released a video explaining my bullish outlook for Slack stock. At the time, Slack was trading for $28 per share. Since that time, it has gone up to all the way around $40 a share, and now it's trading at $27 a share. So I think that enough time has passed for me to review my thesis on Slack stock. Am I still convinced with the thesis I laid out in my earlier video or has my outlook changed for this stock? Before I start, if you're looking to buy stocks in the United States, check out M1 Finance, link in the description if you'd like to support the channel. And without further ado, let's get started. Before I review my investment thesis on Slack stock, let me quickly review my halalness rating for Slack. There really has been no material changes in the way that Slack makes its money, nor in the way that this company conducts itself. So there is no change in my halalness rating as it relates to these aspects of the business. In terms of Slack's financials, last time I reviewed Slack, it had no debt. Since then, Slack has raised $750 million in a convertible note, which is basically debt that the investor can convert into equity under certain conditions. Now, this debt had a half a percentage point interest attached to it. So let's talk about what interest income Slack is earning and what interest expense Slack is incurring and compare these numbers with the size of Slack's operation. So for the three months ended in July 2020, interest expense divided by total operating expense for Slack was around 4.5%. Interest income divided by revenue for Slack was around 3.2%. So these numbers are higher than ideal, but are not at a level that would cause me to think that Slack relies on interest to function or that interest was part and parcel of Slack's business model. So I remain comfortable investing in Slack from a halalness perspective. Now let's review my investment thesis on Slack and see if it has changed. And in order to do this, let's recall what my investment thesis was. Basically, my investment thesis on Slack was as follows. Slack is a communication and collaboration tool that is more effective than email. Rather than having group members with very narrow views of what is going on around them through their email inbox, Slack organizes information and messaging into channels. These channels enable users to see all relevant conversations that are being had about a certain topic within a certain organization. This improves remote communication and collaboration, things that companies are increasingly finding necessary to be very good at. Accordingly, it makes sense that most companies will either have Slack or a Slack-like service, similar to how most companies utilize email in some capacity. Slack seems to be the best in breed out of the available products in the space. It has a very strong balance sheet and having only captured a low single digit percentage of the overall addressable market has a lot of room to grow. Therefore, it's logical to expect strong growth for Slack moving forward and by extension, strong growth for Slack's stock price. This is in a nutshell what my thesis on Slack was. It is a rather simple thesis as I think most good investment theses are. Now the question that suggests itself is, has any of this changed? I think for many, there has been a change in the rosiness of Slack's outlook that has been primarily caused by Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is Slack's main competition and they have grown their daily active users much faster than Slack has. Microsoft Teams boasts 75 million daily active users, whereas Slack, last time I reported this number in October of 2019, had only 12 million daily active users. We don't know what Slack's current daily active user count is, but one can assume that Slack decided to no longer disclose this number because it is not as impressive as Microsoft's 75 million number. In a call with reporters, CEO Stuart Butterfield said, what matters is paying customers not daily active users. But that's not entirely accurate because paying customers often start out as non-paying customers. In fact, this is the natural progression of Slack's customer base. 
Therefore, daily active users can help forecast how many paying customers the company will have in the future, how much growth the company is going to experience. There is, however, some truth in what Slack CEO said since the daily active user count doesn't say anything about the level of activity the users are engaged in. Are they using the tool once a day or 10? For one hour or five? This matters. I never intentionally use Microsoft's internet browser, nor do I know of anyone else who has loved ones who care for them that use the Microsoft browser. But it does manage to pop up every now and then because of Microsoft's bundling of their browser with their operating system. So when their browser pops up by mistake, does Microsoft consider me an active user? So daily active users is not nothing, nor is it something you can necessarily hang your hat on. Further adding merit to the narrative that Slack is getting squeezed by Microsoft is the fact that Slack filed a complaint against Microsoft with the European Commission in July of 2020. Now, Slack alleges in the complaint that Microsoft abused its market dominance to eliminate competition for its Teams product by tying it to its popular Office productivity suite. Slack claims that move meant millions were forced to install the app without the ability to remove it. I can say from personal experience that this is probably true. I have the Microsoft Office package, which means I also have Microsoft Teams. I don't need Microsoft Teams because I use Slack. However, Teams was installed on my laptop. Slack has asked for remedies, including separating Teams from the Office suite and giving the product a visible price. Currently, the price of Teams is built into the price of the Office suite. So all of this is not a good look for Slack and perhaps has shaken investor confidence in this company, which I think, frankly, is understandable. However, at the end of the day, the stock is not the business and the business is not the stock. So let's look at Slack's business over the last six months and what it has done. Slack's guidance for this year's revenue, of which two quarters have already been accounted for, is close to 870 million compared to 621 million in the year prior, a 40% increase. Slack's quarterly revenue growth year over year has remained just shy of 50% every quarter for the past three quarters in a row. The company reported a total of 130,000 paid customers in Q2 of 2020. That represents a 30% increase from last year. Additionally, Slack reported that its net dollar retention rate was 125%, meaning that clients were spending 25% more on Slack products than last year as they added more users and services to their accounts. On their balance sheet, Slack has $1.5 billion in cash and they are quickly heading to profitability with gross margins nearing 90%. Additionally, the stickiness of Slack's application on Slack customers is constantly increasing because of the integrations with other apps that Slack offers. Slack offers integrations with more than 800 other apps, whereas Microsoft Teams only supports integrations with 250 other apps. So as an organization, if you have the Slack application and you have it integrated with 15 other applications that you are using, it is much less likely for you to switch from Slack to some other Slack-like service and lose all of these integrations that you set up. So Slack is really embedding itself into the fabric of their customers' operations and making itself really indispensable for many of its customers. Additionally, I would say the prospects for growth for Slack remain huge. Furthermore, in June of 2020, Slack rolled out Slack Connect, which allows Slack users to not only communicate and collaborate with other members within the same organization, but also to securely collaborate with other organizations. Cross-company collaboration using Slack Connect adds yet another layer of stickiness to Slack as companies that are used to communicating with one another over Slack will find it very hard to change to some other service that the external company they are communicating with may not be that familiar with. Take, for example, Amazon. 
Under a deal struck in June of 2020, all Amazon employees will have access to Slack. Now, I'm not sure how many vendors Amazon works with, but I'm pretty sure it's a very large number. If Amazon is using Slack and it wishes to communicate with a vendor using Slack, this will likely motivate this vendor to get Slack if it hasn't already. Now, imagine what type of growth just this one partnership with Amazon can cause for Slack. Slack Connect is a major point of differentiation for Slack against Microsoft Teams and other competitors and can really supercharge Slack's growth in the years ahead. So I think that Slack has many years of solid growth ahead of it. And when you combine this prospect with the fact that Slack has $1.5 billion in cash on its balance sheet, and it is heading very quickly towards profitability with gross margins around 90%. I think the merits of investing in Slack are still very much intact. Now, it is not as much of a layup as an investment in Tesla stock is, in my view, and that's why it's a much smaller percentage of my portfolio. Currently, I have it at 10% of the Practical Islamic Finance portfolio that you can see using the link in the description below. And as always, anything you heard in this video is simply my opinion. It is not investment advice. Make sure you do your own due diligence before you make any investment decisions. Never invest money that you can't afford to lose. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate if you left a like, subscribe for more content. Until next time, make sure to take care of yourself. Assalamu alaikum and peace be upon you all.